I'm Brian Freisey alongside Laura Duncan, and you're listening to the Triggered and True podcast. This is a podcast that's all about you, discovering you, going back for you, being with you. You're more than the pain you've experienced, the behaviors you're expressing, and the thoughts that run through your head. Together, we will find your true self, which has always been with you. It's just been covered up. Tune in as we show you how to feel your pain, get comfort, and go play as you return to you. It's time to transform from triggered to true. Hello and welcome everyone to this episode of Triggered and True. Exciting episode because this is the third episode of our trilogy of our series (laughs) on connecting the compassion method to the Christian faith. So how are you doing today, Laura? Doing good. What number is this? Uh, What number podcast? Number 47. Wow. Yeah. We're cranking them out. (laughs) So to give everybody just a little review, uh, if you haven't caught the first two podcasts, and uh, so we'll catch you up here real quick. So we we really wanted to take this time to, we hadn't really ever done a series of podcasts that, you know, connect compassion methods specifically to Christianity. And part of the reason is that, for that, is because the compassion method You don't have to be a Christian for the compassion method to have a profound impact on your life. Um, But it just so happens that both Laura and I I are Christians. And as Laura uh, established the compassion method, there was definitely a lot of connections and inspiration that came from her faith. So we felt it was important to, to do this. So kind of where we've been. So we start off by talking about our uh, true self as being created in the image of God. So our true self was created in God's image. And as Christians, we believe that God is love. So our true self is love. We'll talk about that a little more today. So why don't we act like that? Because if you look around the world and even at a lot of Christians, you recognize that they don't act like love. Uh, They act like maybe the opposite of love sometimes. (laughs) Well, the reason is that they and all of us, every human being on the planet is covered up to an extent by our pain and unmet need. And really that pain is coming from the unmet needs that we have uh, that really trace back to our early childhood development. So we talked about God's design being that um, these unmet needs or these needs that Laura has called the 10 gifts because they're given to us as little gifts of love. And that God's design was that for our biological parents to be the deliverers of those gifts to us, and that those gifts come in both a male and female and dad. We talked about how Jesus could have walked out of heaven as a 30-year-old man and started to preach. He could have had angels raise him. He could have had all kinds of other things, but he chose to have them uh, experience life exactly like us and receive these emotional needs, these 10 gifts through biological parents. So... So why is the world the way that it is? Because we are all living the consequences of these needs not being met in early childhood development. So um, none of us had perfect parents and there's also no villains. You know, our parents did, they gave us what they had to give us. You know, in some cases that was more than others, but they did the best they could with what they knew by and by. And a very core element of the compassion method is to recognize there are no villains because what ends up happening when we have villains is we deflect from actually taking care of ourselves. You know, we make it all about the villain and we don't focus on our own heart, which is really the main event here, not the villain. So very much a core belief of the compassion method is that God knew in advance what our parents could and could not give us in that early childhood development. And he had a plan in place. And that plan in place consisted of delivering those gifts to us through other channels. Mm -hmm. And so much of what the compassion method is designed to do is give us eyes to see where God provided for us in those places that our parents couldn't. And that's the 10 gifts. And we talk about, you know, where have they came from? We talked about teachers and relatives and in some crazy instances, you know, even our own children. You know, as they become adults, we talked about how uh, that can happen. Um, We talked about how friends can be the bearers of that. And 
again, uh, so much of what the compassion method is designed to do is give us eyes to see where God was sending us that love, where those, yeah. those uh, unmet needs were being met in early childhood development, which means the Christian message, Jesus tells us to turn and become like a child. We're going to have to go back into those places and kind of go back into that early childhood time to connect with those um, and be able to transform our mind. You know, the Bible talks about being transformed by the renewal of our mind. So we have to go back into that childhood coding. And that's a core, a core aspect or a great, great place where science and the compassion method uh, interact. Um, so it's really neat. And uh, so all of humanity is carrying basically these little balls of pain around. Some of us have bigger balls than others, and some of us have smaller balls. Some of us have done better jobs uh, taking care of that, stewarding our heart. We talked about yeah. Proverbs 4.23, where it says, above all else, guard your heart. And that's really like, how well have you comforted that pain in your yeah. heart? That's really what that's describing. And uh, But a lot of people are carrying around these balls of pain and have absolutely no idea they're there. Yeah. And but they feel the pain of it consciously mm -hmm. and or subconsciously the reaction of it. Yeah. and the reaction. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to do anything to take care of it, but actually take care of it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. like nobody wants to feel it. And <laughs> as human beings, like we've made these incredible uh, advancements in physical pain and how to deal with that and not to minimize that whatsoever. It's just that as a society, as a humanity, we've done more yeah. in that area then we have actually in helping people deal with emotional pain. Yeah. And I think what's really cool, especially in the United States, and I think in a lot of the, the first world countries, is there is a big focus on this now, mm -hmm. more so than there ever has been. Unfortunately, it also leads to, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, does lead to a huge rise in uh, prescriptions and mm -hmm. uh, things like that. But um, but again, people are doing the best they can with what they know. And it's not that those things don't have a place. It's just that it's not going to bring that ultimate healing that we're, we're looking for. Yeah. And we even talked about how religion itself can become one of those medications. And Laura shared a lot of her personal testimony on the, the first part. So episode uh, 45, won't go into that in great detail, but uh, there was one great quote that God shared with you at the beginning of your journey. Um, mm -hmm. Could you share that again? Yeah, definitely. He just um, really simply said, I want you to stop medicating with me. And it was huge to me because I think of God as being a medication, but the same, you know, when they study the brain um, connected to religion or worship or prayer, it actually releases serotonin and releases endorphins that make us feel better be by being able to, to connect with God, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we've connected to his pain, just like with any, to our pain, just like with any medication, you know, you cover it up, you don't actually take care of it. And so when you cover yourself up with religion or with God, you're not actually taking care of the pain underneath it. You're, you're medicating. So you feel better. And then you go home and you have a trigger, you have a reaction and you're back into your pain again, because we're not actually taking care of it. We're just medicating it. Yep. Yeah, so that was uh, really dug into that deeper in the uh, first episode. And where we left off in the last episode is we talked about the remote control process. That's part of the compassion method and really kind of adding a little more depth to it by bringing God into the process. And there's multiple ways that we talked about doing that. One of them was when we're kind of looking for the gift givers, I shared about how I always just pray. I'm like, Holy Spirit, show me. Like, I can't see it right now. Um, show me where I experience play. Show me show me that tangible person that you had mm -hmm. in my life that I experienced play through. And then also help me feel it. Yeah. You know, help me feel what it's like. Um, that unfortunately, you know, that was a gift that my parents, the gift of play was not a gift that my parents were able to give me. They didn't have mm -hmm. it. They didn't have it in their arsenal to give. And... Um, so, you know, show us, show us where, so that's, that's one very simple, practical way to, uh, incorporate your faith into this process. Yeah. And then we also talked about, we really finished the episode with talking about how to add, um, kind of revisiting some of those past encounters we've had with the Lord and maybe, uh, you know, like a past encounter where, 
God did something that was a little bit beyond natural and maybe supernatural. You know, he connected with you in a dream or just an impression that you had, or, and I talked about a dream that I had where, um, um, God was, uh, or I was in a, as in a meeting hall or a classroom. And then the professor was speaking on Psalm 22. And I couldn't wait to get to Psalm 22 the next morning when I woke up, because I knew this had to be from God, because it just felt so supernatural. And I talked about this profound experience that I had at the end of that episode. And, um, part of my homework was I needed to go back and revisit that experience yeah. and um, bringing in a little bit more of the knowledge of what I know today about the compassion method, you know, into yeah. that experience. And I did that. And the thing I was sharing with, with you, Laura, before we started was my biggest take home was I was able to feel more mm. than even what I did the first time. Wow. And I really think it's because this process of the whole, the whole compassion method process has been teaching me to learn to feel. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about that. Like people don't think about feeling as something you need to practice, mm -hmm. but can you just highlight a little bit of that? Yeah. You know, I think we all think either we're feelers or we're not feelers. Like there's certain people that are emotionally connected and there's certain people that aren't, but we are all completely capable. You know, every single person's brain has the same capability of feeling emotion as anyone else. But because of usually an early childhood development, we weren't either encouraged or potentially it was even discouraged to feel emotions because you know how when children feel emotions, it doesn't always, um, it doesn't always look the best. Sometimes yeah. there'll be big emotions. Sometimes but it's a little more socially reactions. acceptable for a child to be throwing a big fit, you know, <laughs> exactly. and crying and screaming than an adult. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. So, but we start out at that time seeing it as a negative or seeing it as something that we have to control or seeing it as something that we need to suppress. And then we get older, we continue that process of suppression and avoidance and disconnection from our emotions because we never learned how. Just like if you never learned a language, it's so much more difficult as an adult to learn that language. And if you think of emotions as a language, we have to actually spend the time to practice and become familiar with emotions, especially if we didn't have that in our early childhood development. So that whole kind of, you know, uh, myth that says that some people don't feel emotions is only because we weren't taught to, or we were discouraged from it. And now we have to relearn how to feel emotions because when we first were born, we felt emotions. We cried when we were hungry. You know, we, we had con a connection to our emotions without even realizing it. Yeah. You know, when I was growing up, there was a lot of shame connected to like crying. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I don't remember felt like it was not exactly sure where it came from, but maybe my parents just not creating space for it or it made them very uncomfortable or something. But I don't remember Definitely. them like yelling at me about crying. I mean, I, I suppose actually it would get disciplined if I um, cried too loud or too much or too long. Like we were allowed to cry. Like if you fell down and got hurt, you could cry an appropriate amount of time, whatever that yep. looked like for the adult. Yeah. And then you had to stop crying. And if you didn't, you'd actually be disciplined to stop crying, to train you to not have too big of emotions. Yeah. You're a cry baby or, you know, whatever yeah, cry people baby, would say. Disciplined. Yep. Exactly. You're over-exaggerating. Yeah. You're, you know, all those. Dramatic. Of, dramatic. Dramatic. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And that's where people get that. I feel like I'm too much because they I think I've maybe, how to express I have it. having four daughters. I think I've maybe shamed them with that dramatic word a time or two. So. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> I've done it myself. Oh, but yeah. God, God, God's gracious and knew knew what I could yeah. give them and what I couldn't. And I know exactly before I knew about any of this, I definitely, uh, yeah, right. One byproduct of that, just a little side thing, is um, it really produces a lot of judgment towards others when you're raised from a young age. That um, being too emotional, being too much, having too big of emotions is actually, you know, bad or wrong or even evil. When you start to think like that, when you see other people have big emotions, it really hinders us from being able to have compassion for others because we only allow it to a certain degree. And I remember when I was learning how to bring comfort to uncomfortable emotions that triggered me with my kids, I, God would tell me, hold them for 10 seconds longer. So I would hold them the appropriate amount of time, whatever that was. But then if they were still screaming and still crying and still hurt, 
I would literally have to count out one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, because yeah. my judgment towards them and my disconnection from them when it reached a certain level was so strong. I literally wanted to push them away, even though I love them and you know right. love them very much. I didn't have the capacity to hold them longer in their big emotions because of the resistance within myself, the judgment within myself. Well, it's kind of a way before you really put your head around this whole process of learning to be with your trigger. Yep, exactly. Yeah, you and that was what I was like practicing. You had to, you yep, had to be I was with practicing it. learning how to be okay in a trigger. And it was so uncomfortable because my whole entire life, if you had a trigger, almost every single time you had a trigger, you got disciplined. Yeah. So you have a built-in resistance towards triggers that they're wrong and bad and that you have to get rid of them instead of actually inviting them in to be able to help us see the pain behind them. Yeah, I'm going to pause it real quick. You're a little bit glitchy. Well, what a great example of learning how to feel, you know, like, yeah. You, and that's kind of what I want to talk a little bit about to, to learn how to feel. We have to learn to be still and be with yeah, our exactly. pain and our emotions. And, um, the verse that came to mind as I was thinking about this was Psalm 46, 10. It says, be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. And we all have this, uh, me in particular, I, a lot of how I've taken care of my heart, like my protectors, my medication has been busyness. Hmm. You know, you know, like one of your homework assignments you gave me a long time ago that I still pretty well suck at is, um, <laughs> You know, you gave me homework of sleeping in, you know, and I feel like so wrong, like <laughs> I need to be up doing something, you know? And so part of the practicing learning to be still part of the practicing, um, for me is, yeah, I'm not going to be able to sleep probably, but it's just kind of like what you said, like holding 10 seconds longer. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm going to lay here for five minutes and I'm going to sit mm -hmm. in this uncomfortableness and I'm going yeah. to focus on comforting the uncomfortableness. Mm -hmm. And you can't get comfort if you won't actually let yourself feel it. Mm -mm. So you have to sit ultimately in that discomfort to get comfort. Yeah. So that, that word, so and I, and I loved what you shared with me about how our doing energy is limited, but what you're, what we're teaching people with the compassion method is how to tap into our being energy. Yeah. When we're connected to our true self, it's light. Mm -hmm. Even if it's heavy, yep. it's light. Even if you're in a heavy situation, your true yeah. self has like this unlimited amount of energy because it's connected to love and love, yep. like love. We're going to talk about this in a little bit, like. Love doesn't grow tired. Mm -mm. Love doesn't grow weary. <laughs> you know, yes, we're physically tired. We have to, we have to sleep, but I think everyone knows what I'm getting at when I'm talking about like that, that impatience, that irritability yep. that, that comes in when we're coming from our doing energy versus our being energy. Yeah. So, so I've, I'll never forget like you sharing that our doing energy is limited. Our being in our energy is unlimited. It's eternal. Yeah. You know, yep. and that's so powerful. So in that verse, that word still, where it says, be still and know that I'm God, that comes from a Hebrew word called rafa, and it means to cease. And I was kind of doing a word study on that. I really liked what it had to say because it like a lot of things spoke to me. It said to let drop, abandon, hmm. relax, refrain, refrain, forsake, to let go, um, to be alone to be yeah. quiet. I like to be quiet. Like yeah. it's hard to sit in quietness. It's hard mm -hmm. to quiet our soul. Yeah. And another, another, uh, tense of that verb I loved, uh, that's closely related. It said to show oneself slack. Hmm. Like, yeah, I don't do a very good job showing myself <laughs> slack, you know? So, um, but what they're talking about here of being still is really what you describe as being learning to be okay or recognizing when you're not yeah. okay, which you define as being clear-minded, tender-hearted, and at peace. Yeah. So anything you want to share on that? 
No, but I think that directly applies to being still, you know, because if you think about those, each part, you know, your mind's clear, you know, we're not still when our mind is going a mile a minute, we've obsessive thoughts and thinking, you know, tenderhearted, we know when our heart is not at rest, when we have pain or unforgiveness or frustrations, you know, we're not able to be still. And then obviously being at peace, being able to be at peace, that okayness is really a gate, a uh, a doorway into being able to be still. Yeah. If you even took one of those three or all of them and kind of connected to yourself in those, you'd be able to come closer to stillness. Yeah. So this, this art of learning to be still, which means we have to, if we're going to be still, we're going to have to face these feelings. Like, but there's just, yep. just there's no, there's no way around. There's them. no way around it. Like as much I've as tried. <laughs> you've tried, we've all tried. Yeah. Well, I mean like, yeah, you have these temporary things. Like for me, like another one was alcohol, like alcohol could help me kind of like skip over it, mm-hmm. <laughs> but like, yeah, yep. then, then, then that wore off and like, there I am again. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. Whatever you yeah. pick, it's only going to help you for s- some duration of time until you're back feeling your pain again, that ball of pain you talk about. So, so fighting, you know, kind of facing that, um, kind of what I wanted to also talk about was even Jesus had to do that and he had to face, face his pain. And, um, specifically where, where I see him doing that in scripture is in the garden of Gethsemane. Like, yeah. When a lot of people think of the crucifixion story, they think of, you know, on the cross as like kind of like physical the physical cli- pain. Yeah. Yeah. And mm-hmm. the physical pain of it. And they think of that as kind of the climax of the story. But I literally look at the climax actually happening in the garden of the climax yeah, of the story. The, cro- the cross was like the resolution. Yeah. Like where and we don't, everything- we don't want to obviously minimize that, but I think that was yeah. obviously the resolution. And that was the physical pain, but all of us know that physical pain, of course, is devastating, but emotional pain is equally devastating. Yeah. And I think it's easier for us to connect to physical pain. And Mm -hmm. again, as a society, we've, we've really focused on that as humanity, we've really focused on that, but we haven't done a phenomenal job as humanity learning to comfort and, and bring the real solutions to our emotional pain, the real lasting ones. So, yeah. so Jesus, I was just going to read from the garden of Gethsemane, uh, from the portion of scripture where it talks about him in the garden yeah. and, and just kind of provide some highlights there. So Matthew, I'm going to read from Matthew 26, 36 through 39. I think, I think this is from the ESV. I didn't write down where it exactly was from, but uh, it says, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to, to said to the disciples and the two sons of Zebedee, and, okay, excuse me, let me just go back, do that again. So Matthew 26, 36 through 39, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. So this is Jesus, like, I need to go do this. Like, I'm going to have to feel this sorrow. I'm going to have to feel this pain. Mm -hmm. And then he went on, the scripture goes on. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Mm -hmm. Stay here and watch with me. Like he wanted them to be with him. But for anyone that knows the story, they recognize that the disciples really weren't able to be with them very well. They didn't know how to be with. Yeah, exactly. They it was didn't probably very uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I when, as I read it in scripture, like they just didn't have a grid for it. Like they did not yeah. have a grid for what he was going through, which is why they yeah. fell asleep. Like if they yeah. would have had more of a no, grid for it. Exactly. Yeah. But so the point of it is, is that Jesus had to do this on his own. Like he had to take the initiative. He had to go let himself feel this. And uh, then it goes on. It says, um, he went a little farther and fell on his face and praying, saying, oh, father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So even Jesus didn't want to have to face this pain. And again, my mind, this is kind of my interjecting my thoughts. This is not like thus saith the Lord thing. But in my mind, what he's really talking about here is the emotional weight mm-hmm. of what he's about to experience. As horrible as the crucifixion was, in my mind, as I look at it, 
that was much easier for Jesus to face than the emotional pain of what he was about to endure. Yeah. And, you, and you think about it, like what was that emotional pain? Like what was he about to endure? Well, he was about to feel the weight of, you know, what does sin do? So if you think about what sin does, sin separates us from God. Not because God separates from us, but because in our sin, we kind of box ourselves off. Like we go yeah. into shame. We talked about this in one of the early episodes. We we're the mm -hmm. ones hiding in the bushes. Yeah. So we separate ourselves. When we separate ourselves from God, we're separating ourselves from love. Mm -hmm. And Jesus hadn't ever sinned. He hadn't ever separated himself from love. He yeah. stayed connected to love all the time. Yeah. And he was about to experience that separation from love. So he was about to experience the weight of every single sin that had ever been committed and, yeah. and every single sin that would be committed into the future. Yeah. But just not, but not just morally. We always kind of think of like the, the pain of the sin of the action that was committed, but not the emotion of the action that was committed by the person or the emotion of the action that the person experienced. That is so much deeper than just the, the moral you know, of course, obviously there's right and wrong, but it was bigger than that. Oh yeah. Cause we talk about the balls of pain that are going around inside of us. Like we have all added to those balls of pain because in yeah. that pain, we do a lot yeah. of stupid crap. And yeah. a lot of that stupid crap is sins. And mm -hmm. that just makes that pain magnifies it exactly. more and more and more mm -hmm. shame and more of that. Well, Jesus was about to feel the weight of all of that, but not just your ball of pain and my ball of pain, but every single ball of emotional pain from every single person that ever was and ever would be, he was going to feel the complete weight of it. And he was going to feel for the first time, like that feeling of not being connected to love. Wow. And, you know, and it says in Luke, it says in being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. It's so wow. like yeah. this this was this was what he was facing. A, a very strong physiological response to what he knew was going to happen and what he knew he was going to experience. Yeah, and I think you know it's hard to wrap our mind our mind. No, it is. I completely. can't even. I mean, I'm like my brain's like, wow, that's huge, but then I'm, I'm still limited by it. Oh yeah, we're we're not going to really be able to do that. But I think the main take home I think for me is that physical pain was horrible. It's but it's all that really gets highlighted about the crucifixion story. But I think there's so much more going on there in the yeah. weight of emotional pain yeah. that Jesus had to face. But what did he do? He had to face it. He yeah. had to let himself feel it. You know, he prayed if there was any other way to take the mm -hmm. cup, you know, but there was no other way. He had yeah. to feel that. And that pattern is the same with us. Mm -hmm. We have to feel our pain. We have to. And it's, it's a hard thing to do. So when going a little further, you're like, okay, well, why would Jesus do all this? Like, this sounds like, <laughs> yeah. like, sounds why, like would you idea. <laughs> why would you sign up for this? And yeah. um, so um, in Hebrews 12, two, it says for the joy set before him, he would endure this. He would endure the cross. Mm -hmm. He would endure what he had to endure in the garden for the joy set before him. So what was yeah. the joy? The joy was that he could be with us mm -hmm. like he felt what we felt you know magnified by you know 50 or however many billion people that will ever live before you know <laughs> the end of time let's say it's 50 billion people whatever so he felt that you know multiplied over so jesus became a human so that he could feel the pain and temptation of being a human so he could be closer to us so he could be yeah. with us yeah, and that's real empathy. <laughs> that's that's actually a quote from you. You said Jesus became a human so that he could feel the pain and temptation of being a human so that he could be closer to us, so that he could be with us. Yeah. So what is the joy set before him? We are. Yeah. To be so with it, us. Wow. To be with us. Yeah. 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 That's uh that's really powerful. And ultimately, so that he could be with us, so that he could share love with us. Mm -hmm. He is love. Yeah. Why were we created? 
We were created for love. We were created mm -hmm. to be loved. We were created yeah. to love others. Like that's mm -hmm. why we were created for love's yeah. sake. We were created. So for love's sake, he endured the cross. Yeah. So that to he be could, with. Yeah. yeah, to be with us so that he could share the joy of that with us. So one thing that you talked about, and I'd like to have you just expand on a little bit. Um, I'll never forget this. Like I heard you say the most, the most devastating thing about a trigger, like when we're not in our true self, when we're not mm -hmm. their mind and ten heart and at peace, we're not connected to love. The most devastating thing about a trigger is it's a period of time when we are separated from ourselves. Yeah. And like, I would always fixate on the damage I did to others in my mm -hmm. trigger, which, yeah. which is appropriate. Of like course. we got to own it. Exactly. That is part of the process, but at the core, it's, but that's also not ourselves. very compassionate because I would just shame myself for mm -hmm. what I did. Others, exactly. You know? And it was just about being good or bad, but it wasn't about actually feeling that pain that we're talking about and being able to be with ourselves in it. And that's what we do. And our trigger, when we're stuck in our amygdala, when we're stuck in fight or flight, we're literally running from ourselves, running from God, running from others, because we're in such a frantic life or death, high stakes place that we no longer can be with ourselves. We can't be still. We can't be connected to love. Right. So yeah, it's a period of time when we're connected, when we're disconnected from ourself and when we're separated from love. Yeah. And we do it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important to face our pain, to feel our pain and to be able to be with ourselves because ultimately we can't be with God. We can't be with anyone else until we're actually able to be there. And if you think about if Jesus did this for the joy set before him, because he was so excited to love and to be with us, even in love, but also in our pain, that he was so excited to be with us, but we don't know how to be with ourselves. How are we going to be able to be with him? Yeah, we can't. Mm -mm. So just because he's died for our sins does not mean that we can actually be with them until we process our pain. There was two things that had to happen. We've talked yeah. about this and we, again, we don't want to minimize it, but the sin was the easy part for him to take care of. <laughs> so what he did was easy. We just talked about no, how no, incredibly no. Yeah. hard it was. Very, very hard. But he controlled but the that into the equation. Of it. But he, yeah. he controlled that part of the equation. This next part yeah. is all on us. 100%. And that's why when we yeah. don't, as a you know culture of Christianity, when we don't connect to our emotions, then we're not able to actually receive the full gospel, to receive the full sacrifice that he gave to us because we're only, we're only connecting to him with what he did, but we're not connecting with who he was and what he did and connecting to his emotions and what he did because we're not connected to ours. Hmm. Yeah. That one you got to think about a little while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause we, we can deep. accept the sacrifice of the action but not the emotional sacrifice of the action. Because if mm -hmm. I don't know how to feel my pain, because I have to suppress that pain, then how am I going to actually be able to receive what he did for me emotionally? Because I'm only connected to what he did. You're and only I'm gonna... so grateful for what he did, but right. it's not the full sacrifice. It's not the full gospel. You're not receiving, no. you're not able to receive you're the not, full thing. Exactly. And that's why I think a lot of Christians are walking around not connected to relationship and love with God because of that. Mm -hmm. Well, it just, it definitely goes back to your medicating, you know, they received. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, is it's almost like, um, you know, the medication doesn't work. You eventually get disillusioned in a lot of cases. And you have to, you know, deconstruct your faith or, you know, do whatever you have to do, you know, <laughs> yeah. to try to up the medication or make it yeah. more. Leave a church, get a new church, <laughs> figure out something. Right. Because get a new Bible. Trying, yeah. you know, get a new Bible. Exactly. We're trying you know, to get out of the pain instead of actually facing the full sacrifice of what he did for us by feeling our pain and learning how to practice, like you said, practice feeling to learn how to be with love. Yeah. You know, and this is this is what I love about reading some of the mystic the mystic mystical writers, you know, in the earlier days of the church. And 
they definitely learned how to be with themselves maybe to a higher degree than what we're able to now you know they maybe had mm -hmm. less distractions or they were able to simplify their life a little bit more to be able to do it but i think from them i kind of get some uh, excitement to try to do this a little bit more because when mm -hmm. i read their writings i'm like are they tapped into something a little bit more in their faith than i've been able to tap into and what i really get more is like a confidence yeah and too much of my faith is connected to be like, I prayed for this person to be healed. Were they healed? Did it turn out okay? And when it mm -hmm. doesn't turn out the way that I want it to, mm -hmm. I'm rocked a little bit. But yet when I read some of that, I feel like obviously by being being able to be with, you're more connected again to who God is, not what he's doing. Exactly. And I think as Christianity, we've probably in a lot of faiths, we're way more connected to what God's doing in yep. our mind or not doing yeah. in our mind yep. than we actually are to the core of who he is. Because like, if I tap into Jesus in the garden and I tap into that sacrifice to the level of I recognize the emotional weight of what he felt and what he endured, yeah. I don't need anything. I like that. What mm -hmm. else is there? Yeah, exactly. You know, like what everything else becomes even cancer becomes trivial. Everything else becomes trivial to that. If I yeah, really how, get that. Exactly. That's how I overcame my, you know, in my faith with my husband dying hmm. was recognizing that, you know, what God does matters. God does a lot of things in our lives, like his sacrifice on the cross. He does a lot in our lives, but it's not about what God does or doesn't do. It's about who he is. And if I can stay connected to who he is, I may still have questions about what he does or doesn't do, but it's already been answered by being with him and knowing who he is that, like you said, other stuff matters, but it becomes so much less important than being with him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that becomes, let's carry this, let's carry this through to our, like even our biological parents, you know, this process is going to reveal what they weren't able to do. So we're very fixated on this process. Mm -hmm. When we're in pain, we're very focused on what they did and what they didn't do. Yeah. But as we, as we receive healing there, we'll be able to receive more of what they could do. We'll mm -hmm. be able to connect more to them with who they are. You know, they're yeah. made, in, they're also made in God's image. Yeah. And they were our parents Yeah. and they loved us with all that they could give. You yep. know, and, and for some that was very, very little, maybe borderline none, you know, yeah. like for, for whatever. And, um, but some, you know, I think we'll be able to connect just, just deeper. Oh so. yeah. I've seen people with just, you know, really very negative, um, early childhood development processes that like, once they're able to connect, to get what they needed from a gift giver and then reconnect with their parents, they're able to see them completely different. And I think that's what true forgiveness of our parents looks like is being able to see them for who they are, not what they did or didn't do. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, we all are going to need to like rewind that part and listen to this last 10 minutes a few times over and over again, because there's so much, there is <laughs> you know, so there much is, depth there. there. It's like, a lot. Oh, wow. You know, but I know, but to kind of, to kind of bring this home and talking about connecting more to love, um, I really wanted to kind of finish our time in this series reading from first Corinthians 13, which is known as the love chapter in the Bible for those unfamiliar. And when we talk about, we were created for love, we were created for love's sake. We're bringing ourselves back to ourselves. We're bringing ourselves back to love. I just think 1 Corinthians 13 does a great job talking about what love looks like. Yeah. You know, Jesus, that's ultimately Jesus came, like he showed us what love looked like. So, so I'm going to read this section of scripture from the ESV. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Then I'm going to do a little spin on it uh, after I read it. So it says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful, does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So 
when we come back to our true selves, when we come back home, which is ultimately the compassion method is <laughs> helping enable people to do is come back home. We can read it a little differently. And one of the things I would recommend for people to do is to take that section of scripture and wherever it says love, insert their name. Because hmm. that's who they are. Yeah. So I'm going to do it reading, putting my name in the place of love. And as I read it, inside of me, there's things saying like, that's not true. That's not true. But the reality is it is true. It is, is who you who are. I, Just because you don't act that way all the time, like we've talked about before, doesn't mean that's not who you are. Yep. And it's not only true of me, mm -hmm. it's true of every single human being that ever was or will be. So I'm going to do it. Brian is patient and kind. Brian does not envy or boast. Brian is not arrogant or rude. Brian does not insist on his own way. Brian is not irritable or resentful. Brian does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but he rejoices with the truth. Brian bears all things. Brian believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Brian never ends. Hmm. So that is everybody's homework. That is our charge. Yeah. Yeah. We are, through the compassion method, helping bring you back to who you were created to be. And that, that is who we were created to be. Yeah. And every time that you're not those things, you're just covered up. Yeah. That's just a part of you that's covered just up. Just a trigger. You're just reacting to pain that's keeping you from being who you are and being able to be love. It is as simple as that. It's not any more complicated than that. Mm -mm. So, so in our conclusion, another thing I'd like to point out, and I was joking with Laura before we started, I said, you know, Laura, Laura is so soft and sweet. You know, <laughs> at times, but yeah, that's true. Times, Laura is soft and sweet at times, but she can also be very fierce and mighty. And we're going to tap into the fierce and mighty side of it here a little bit, because as I was talking to her beforehand, um, I said, one thing that I think we should emphasize a little bit more in the compassion method that this is a freaking battle. So C.S. Lewis says for Christianity is a fighting religion. Hmm. And what, but here's the thing. It's not fighting like you think mm -mm. of fighting. You're okay? not fighting externally. <laughs> yeah. The full, the fought, the war is fought from the inside out. Yeah. So Jesus was a, rev here was what I wrote. I said, Jesus was a revolutionary of the heart. And the battle we are facing is our pain. Like, He's like, we have to do that. And what I wrote here is that we all have our own garden of Gethsemane to reckon with. You know, we want our friends yeah. to be with us. We want to bring them along. Yeah. We want to, we want other people, human beings to be with us in those moments. Yeah. But the reality is, is that's great, but we have to do that part alone. Individually, we have to face it. And the only way it. out is through. Yeah. So like we are a like we are a general in this army. Like we are it is an absolute knockdown drag out war at times to do mm -hmm. this because yeah. no part of you wants you to, to turn go there. the tide. Yeah. Yeah, and but what you're fighting for is yourself. Mhm. Mm and everyone listening like you're worth it. Yeah. I mean, look in the mirror. Like you are worth fighting for. Yeah. And if you can't look at yourself in the mirror right now, do the child picture exercise. Mm -hmm. Find that little child. Start by fighting for your child self until you exactly. can fight for yourself now. Exactly. Yeah, and you, know, you think about compassion. It, that's what it is. Compassion is fierce too. It's not always just quiet and tender. Compassion is passionate. Yeah, absolutely. And like you're never going to be able to receive the full extent of what Jesus died to give you. Yeah. If you don't do this. That's if true. you don't, if you don't fight this battle, which is what Proverbs four twenty three is saying, above all else, guard. You know, above all else, yeah. fight for, yeah, mm -hmm. fight, for, fight your heart. for your heart. Yeah, yeah. Jesus showed us what love looked like, and also how to fight for it. Yeah. So we want to fight like Jesus fought. 
Mm-hmm. It's when not that an trigger external comes battle. up, yeah, yeah. yeah, and everything in you wants to resist it and blame and disconnect from it, it's coming close to it. It's actually embracing the trigger to be able to be connected. Yeah. Yeah, it's really powerful and really deep stuff. So um, kind of my closing charge I put here, I said, so the question remains, will you live from your pain? Or will you live from who you were created to be? Your true self. Yeah, yeah. You are the author of your story. You get to answer this question. 100%, like it's 100% in your control to do this, Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Which is both extremely <laughs> scary yeah. and extremely wonderful all at the same time. Yeah. The scary uh, part is like, oh my gosh, I can't rely on someone else to do this for me. No, nope, mm-hmm. you can't. No. Nope. But the good part is yeah. you don't have to rely on someone else. You don't <laughs> exactly. it's not dependent on somebody else showing no. up in the right way or your spouse yeah. or your loved ones or your parents or your relatives or whoever, like. You know, your you boss, whoever, yeah. you get to do this. Mm-hmm. And and that's what the compassion method is for. You yeah. get to do this. That's what the whole setup of it is for you to do it on your own. You know, even this podcast is just coming along and supporting you. I myself, as the founder of it, is just I'm just supporting others, facilitating their journey to connect with themselves. And that's why you can do this on your own. Yeah. Yeah. Exciting. Well, Laura, thank you so much for pouring your heart and soul into the Compassion Method to give all of us this wonderful um, help meet uh, to help us do this, to help us fight this battle for our hearts, to help us, yeah, yeah, to help us return back to ourselves, to Mm -hmm. even be aware that that we're not connected to ourselves. Yeah, exactly. Definitely will be challenging. Definitely will be difficult. I'd say doing this process has been the hardest process I've ever done but also the most hopeful and rewarding as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you, Laura. And thank you listeners for joining us on this journey. Thank you everyone uh, for listening. Absolutely. Until next time. Goodbye.